Good afternoon and thanks for joining me for this afternoon's webinar on the how-to of property settlement. Uh, my name is Amy Ryan. I'm a senior associate here at Michael Lynch Family Lawyers and an accredited specialist in family law. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with us, uh, Michael Lynch Family Lawyers are a specialist firm of family lawyers. We've been established for over 20 years. Um, we have 11 lawyers five of which are accredited specialists um, and we help clients with all aspects of their family law disputes whether that's advice, negotiation, mediation or court representation. Um, we offer our clients um, an initial fixed cost interview um, when they can come in and see us without um, further obligation to get advice about their situation, um, their strategy for moving forward and their likely costs if they were to engage us. Now, in talking about family law, it covers quite a wide scope of areas. Um, obviously, separation and divorce, um, property settlement, which we'll be talking about today, um, parenting arrangements, child support, spouse maintenance, domestic violence, um, relocation, so if you're wanting to move into state or overseas with your children, um, paternity, change of name, and international child abduction. Um, as I mentioned today, we're just talking about property settlement. Um, what is a property settlement? How do we assess entitlements for our clients? How do we help our clients reach an agreement? Um, how do we finalise that agreement once we get there? And then also some practical considerations that um, some little tips we give to our clients when they're um, first starting out on their um, separation journey. Um, and it might be the sorts of things you might want to think about um, if you have some clients dealing with these situations themselves. Um, so the aim of this presentation obviously is to give you an overview about the area of property settlement um, so that you can um, have some awareness if you've got some clients dealing with these sorts of issues. Um, first thing I want to talk about is what is a divorce? Um, that is a legal severance of the marriage. Um, it is a bit different from property settlement. <coughs> um, so it's, it's actually quite a straightforward process compared to the other issues. Uh, in Australia we have a no-fault um, jurisdiction which means that <coughs> Excuse me. The only ground for divorce is that the marriage has broken down irretrievably. There's no need to prove any sort of um, issues like adultery, abandonment, abuse, etc. Um, it is possible to make um, either a separate application for divorce or a joint application. So um, once you've been separated for 12 months, either party can make the application. You don't actually need the consent uh, of both parties to proceed with the divorce. Contrasting that with what is a property settlement? Um, it's a really complicated and multifaceted area and each case is very different. Um, essentially the actual property settlement is the alteration of existing legal entitlements to property. So the parties will already own property um, assets, liabilities, superannuation, etc. Um, in various ways and it's a question of whether that should be altered now that they have separated. Property settlement is available to both married couples and also de facto couples who meet the relevant criteria, which I'll speak about in a bit more depth in a moment. Um, it's important to understand that the aim of a property settlement is to um, sever the financial relationship between spouses who have separated so far as possible. Um, we call that the clean break principle in Section 81 of the Act. Um, the main reason for that is that um, Obviously, ongoing joint ownership of assets, joint indebtedness, etc., can lead to um, all sorts of um, issues with conflict down the track, um, particularly when couples have separated and no longer on good terms. Um, so it's really important to, so as far as possible, um, separate the financial affairs of the parties. Um, it's not always possible to do immediately. Um, for example, some people might continue running a business together for a period of time, or um, if there is, um, say, a property that they're not in a position to sell at the moment, the market's not good, um, they might want to hang on to it for a period of time. We recommend not doing that so much as possible, but um, if it's sort of the financial reality of the parties, then um, we want to make sure that any agreement um, covers all the potential eventualities of that, like who we're paying the mortgage in the meantime, um, what happens if they don't, what if someone wants to sell um, earlier than the time period they've agreed to hold it for, etc. Um, when negotiating a property settlement, it's also important to understand that each party has an obligation of full and frank disclosure to the other party. Um, that is disclosure of all of their relevant financial circumstances and that usually includes um, exchange of documents. Um, and that's often where we might get parties to contact their accountant to um, make sure that they've got all the relevant documents if they run a business um, or 
uh, operate through a company or trust. Um, if parties refuse to give that information, um, it is possible to issue subpoenas um, for that material to be provided from the third party. Um, as I mentioned, um, property settlement is available to de facto couples as well. Um, obviously with a married couple, it's quite easy to determine that. You've got a marriage certificate, you're married on a particular date. Um, with a de facto relationship, it can be a little bit easier to sort of fall into the de facto relationship and to be a bit unclear as to whether you're actually in one, when it started, etc. cetera. Um, so what the court does is look at this definition here. Um, it's the parties are not legally married to each other and are not related by family. So we're not talking about um, a brother and sister living together, a parent and child, or friends, family. Um, we're talking about a marriage-like relationship and having regard to all the circumstances of their relationship, they have a, a relationship as a couple together on a genuine domestic basis. So we look at things like whether they live together, um, financial interdependence, sexual relationship, um, whether they have any children, the public aspects of their relationship, etc. cetera. Um, interestingly, you can be in a de facto relationship even if you're married to someone else or in a de facto relationship uh, with someone else. Um, apart from being in a de facto relationship, you also have to meet some gateway criteria, or one of the four gateway criteria to actually be able to bring an application for property settlement. Um, the relationship either needs to be for at least two years, um, there's a child of the relationship, we've made some substantial contributions, for example, um, funds going into a property, um, or the relationship is registered, which is uh, not applicable in Queensland at the moment. So first let's dispel some myths about property settlement. Um, there is no rule that you get 50-50 um, if you get married. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, it is not a case of whatever you get out, uh, sorry, whatever you put in is what you get out. Um, and there's no requirement that everything gets sold up to be separated. We're talking about adjusting um, the ownership of assets. Um, sometimes that does mean that realistically people need to sell, but if someone can afford to keep um, an asset um, then the court wouldn't make orders for that to be sold. Um, there is a time limit for applying for property settlement. Um, if you're married, it's one year from your divorce order becoming final, which as I mentioned, you can't apply for a divorce until you've been separated for 12 months or more. So um, at least sort of a two year period usually for marriages and for de facto relationships, it's two years from the date of your separation. Um, that's the time limit for applying to court. You can reach an agreement outside of that, but um, given that a court application is always sort of the, the last resort, um, you don't want to run out of time to um, get your property settlement um, entitlements, I suppose. So if we're trying to negotiate a settlement and someone's running out of time, uh, we might file an application with the court just to preserve their rights um, to pursue the matter through the court if they can't reach an agreement. So property settlement, how do we actually work out what each party gets? Um, it's not a mathematical exercise at all. Um, the court has a very wide discretion. Um, there's a series of factors that the court has to consider and weigh against each other and come to a result that is overall just and equitable. Um, the first question we really have to consider is, should we actually be doing a property settlement in the first place or altering um, the party's existing property entitlements? Um, there's a High Court case of Stanford in 2012, which um, put this question at the forefront of lawyers' minds, um, that in most cases, um, a property settlement is not contentious. Um, the parties have separated, they need to go their separate ways, so um, a property settlement should occur. However, uh, the case of Stanford was an unusual one, but it might be something that's becoming a bit more common um, with our ageing population. Uh, so in this particular case, it was an elderly couple in their second marriage, although it had been a very long marriage, um, and they wanted to stay married and intended to stay married. Um, you can actually have a property settlement whilst you are continuing in a relationship. Again, it's a bit unusual. Um, in this particular case, uh, the wife was in an aged care facility and the husband remained in the home, uh, which was in his sole name. Um, both of the parties had actually lost capacity, so their respective children actually carried on the proceedings for them. Um, in particular, the wife's adult daughters brought the application and took it all the way to the higher court for a property settlement because um, 
reading between the lines, they essentially wanted to protect a potential inheritance. The court decided in that particular case that because the husband was paying for the wife's um, accommodation at the aged care facility, um, and he would have to sell the house to give her a property settlement, which at that point she didn't need, um, that in that particular case, um, there should be no further property settlement. So that was a bit of an outlier uh, in terms of unusual circumstances, but perhaps something that we might see a bit more regularly uh, with an ageing population and people on second relationships. So leaving those kind of exceptional cases aside, for most clients, um, a property settlement is not contentious. So we go through this four-step process to work out uh, what their entitlements should be. So the first one is to identify and value the net property. Second step is to assess each party's contribution to getting to that net position. Um, then we assess their future needs moving forward from the relationship and ultimately decide with um, the, in the final consideration what have we come up with and is that overall just and equitable to the parties in this particular case. So talking in a bit more detail about those steps. Uh, step one, what is in the asset pool? Now that is all assets, liabilities and superannuation in either party's name um, or owned through a relevant trust or company. And the value of those assets is taken at the current time. So um, whether that's two years post separation, they're coming to um, an agreement or three years post separation and the court is determining it, we're always looking at the starting point being the current market value um, of those items. And if the parties can't reach an agreement on what the value should be, then um, we would get an independent valuer to um, make an assessment. So for real estate, obviously a property valuer, there's a number of generalist valuers who will do furniture, contents, um, vehicles. For a business company or trust, we would engage a forensic accountant. Um, in very rare circumstances, it might be appropriate to order the sale of the property. Um, if the court is unable to determine its value. Um, I've got a situation like that at the moment where um, the parties have an apartment at the coast, um, two separate valuers have valued it um, hundreds of thousands of dollars differently. Um, so they've really had no option but to put it to the market to test what the value actually is. It's a bit of an unusual situation, but sometimes it does happen. Um, as I mentioned, property has a very broad definition and includes basically every possible interest that a person can have. Um, just looking at some particular examples, um, companies and trusts, whilst being a separate legal entity, um, if the parties effectively have control of that entity, then that's going to be included as property. Um, even if a party is not a trustee of a trust or a director of a company, but they still in some way have control over it as the appointer, for example, um, it might still be considered as an asset of the parties. The important aspect there is control. Um, obviously, if someone is the beneficiary of, uh, you know, a family trust that's run by, you know, a grandparent or something like that, and they occasionally get distributions, that's different. But if it's something that one or both of the parties effectively have control over, then that's going to be included as one of their assets, even though it has um, a separate legal entity for other purposes. Um, and this is a quote from the case of Ashton, which really talks about that, um, that it's all about um, sort of de facto ownership and control of the property. Um, so in a family situation, the family court is not bound by formalities designed to obtain advantages and protection for a party who stands in reality in the position of the owner. Um, it is the kind of area that um, a lot of people get a bit tripped up with. Um, this case of Kenan and Spry um, is very famous in family law circles for numerous appeals and going all the way to the High Court. And um, in that case, Mr Spry was actually a QC in Victoria, a specialist in trusts, um, and he, even he still came a cropper in this particular area where his carefully designed trust that he ultimately still controlled came into the pool for the property settlement. Um, overseas property can also be included. Um, again, we're finding this a little bit more common now with um, people moving around so much internationally. Um, so the court can make orders um, dealing with that property. It's just enforcement in the other country that's a problem. Um, for example, I've got some uh, clients with property in India at the moment. Uh, we can't force an, and enforce an Australian court order in India, but we can still factor it in as um, an asset that one party is retaining um, in that country. 
um, inheritances, uh, something that clients ask about all the time. Um, it really depends on has it been received, um, is it about to be received, um, or is it a potential inheritance? So if it's already been received, then yes, it's property. It comes in as um, part of the asset pool. If it is um, merely sort of an expectation that you're going to receive an inheritance from your parents' estate at some point, um, we do not include it because um, obviously as, as long as the testator still has the capacity to change their will and leave it all to the you know, RSPCA or something like that instead, um, there is no certainty that it's ultimately going to be received. Um, if you have a situation where, let's say, an elderly parent um, is in good health but has lost legal capacity to make a new will, then it might be considered as a financial resource. So that is something that um, is not a certainty but is an advantage that um, one party is likely to get down the track and we take that into account. Um, as a future needs factor, which I'll discuss in a few moments. Pets, we get asked about pets all the time. Unfortunately, the court looks at them as being property. They're not children. We can't make contact orders for um, pets. They are just treated as a chattel like um, you know, the furniture, unfortunately. Um, superannuation, of course, forms part of the asset pool. Um, it didn't prior to 2002, it was a financial resource that we had to consider. Um, however, since 2002, we can split superannuation. So it is treated as an asset of the parties. It can be um, split as part of the property settlement to affect a division. Um, however, it's a slightly different category in that it remains a superannuation. So um, if let's say the husband is splitting $100,000 of his superannuation to the wife, it remains as superannuation for the wife and she can't access it until she's otherwise able to access her superannuation in the ordinary course. Um, overseas jurisdiction uh, for superannuation, um, similar to other overseas property, um, we don't have um, the power to deal with that, so it's, inclu it's um, included in the considerations, but we can't order splitting of overseas superannuation or pension funds. Um, when it comes to valuing superannuation, there is a process there for obtaining the relevant information. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more complicated than what is just on the, um, the party's member statement. Um, particularly defined benefit funds, um, military super, Q super, things like that. Um, we normally have to get an actuary to actually perform the valuation on that once we get the base information to do that calculation. Um, capital gains tax and realisation costs. Um, is another one of those it all depends kind of situations. Um, it really depends on um, how likely it is that the property is going to be sold um, in the near future. So if it is something where um, as part of a property settlement, a property is going to have to be sold um, and there is going to be a capital gains tax liability associated with that and other realisation costs such as agents fees, et cetera, um, then we would include those as liabilities in the asset pool. Uh, however, if it's something where, for example, the parties have um, a house and an investment property, one party's keeping the house, one party's keeping the investment property, um, it's just something that we want to make sure the clients are aware of that they're effectively taking on um, that latent capital gains tax liability because um, the transfer pursuant to a family law agreement um, is we get rollover relief for the capital gains tax. Um, so it means that the, it's not a crystallising event. The party takes on um, the original cost base of the property that they're keeping. So um, that's the kind of thing where we don't necessarily take it into account as a liability, um, but depending on the amount, um, it might be something we consider again as a future needs factor in our third step of the assessment process. Uh, I think I've covered some of those things, business value, how do we do those? Um, obviously any sort of tax liabilities need to be understood and taken into account, including any sort of latent capital gains tax. Um, Division 7A is a bit more of an issue for the, um, the actual implementation. Um, a lot of our clients um, tend to uh, treat the funds of companies and things that they operate as their own um, and often end up with some issues with Division 7A or other tax issues when it comes to unravelling it all in a property settlement. So um, very important for our clients to get advice about that uh, early and often during the proceedings. 
Um, so that's the first step, what have we arrived at in terms of our net property. The second step is to look at what contributions each party has made to arrive at that um, uh, asset pool. So it's a, a retrospective analysis. So we start from the very beginning, at the start of um, their cohabitation, did anyone have any significant assets that has led to um, a springboard for the accumulation of other assets during the relationship? Um, during the relationship, we then look at obviously any financial um, contributions, but we also look at non-financial contributions. Um, they might include things like maintenance for a property to maintain an asset, um, managing an investment portfolio, um, undertaking renovations to a property that someone is doing themselves with their own labour rather than employing tradespeople and that increase the value of the property. Um, something that is very important is also homemaking and parenting contributions. And more and more we're recognising that care provided by grandparents um, and also children from previous relationships are also relevant and important contributions. Um, depending on how long the parties have been separated, we might also look at post-separation contributions and who's been doing what in the period since the parties separated, um, if that's a significant period versus the period of their relationship. Um, so it's really a case-by-case -case assessment um, of the overall contributions. Um, it's a little bit of a rule of thumb that um, in long marriages, particularly if there have been children, that we're probably looking at an equal assessment of contributions unless that's something really significant from outside of the relationship, like a big inheritance that one party received um, or very significant assets at the start of the relationship. In a shorter relationship, particularly if there are no children, um, we, it's much more of a, um, an assessment of the respective financial contributions and you're more likely to sort of get back out what you put in. Um, as I mentioned, uh, gifts and inheritances can be a significant factor that swings the contributions assessment in one party's favour um, because they're generally um, considered as a, a contribution from the party who received the inheritance. Um, but it depends on how big that inheritance is compared to um, the overall asset pool, when it was received and how it was used. So um, there's no rule that you necessarily get to exclude an inheritance like that. Um, it, again, it all depends. Um, bad behaviour. Um, this is often a big concern for clients. Um, Infidelity and other moral wrongs are generally not relevant to the assessment of contributions, um, but they can certainly be relevant to the dynamics of negotiations. Um, but in terms of uh, getting compensated for someone being a bad wife or husband, um, unfortunately, no, we don't do that. Um, however, if um, someone has engaged in really wasteful behaviour, um, that can sometimes be relevant. So ordinarily we sort of have this partnership principle that um, you ride the highs and lows of a partnership of a relationship together. So if someone makes, makes a bad investment decision or um, does particularly well in investments or something like that, you share those. Um, however, if someone has really done something negligent, um, you know, gambled the life savings at the track or something like that, those might be considered um, a negative contribution and might be relevant. Um, there is also a line of cases that suggest that in very serious cases of domestic violence, that conduct can be relevant if it is impacted on the victim's ability to actually contribute themselves. Right, so we've come to an assessment of um, the percentage split based on contributions. So looking back, we now need to look forward to each party's respective future needs moving forward from the relationship. Um, so we really look at each if there's any disparity in each party's position, um, usually for reasons like their difference in age or whether someone has some significant health issues, um, respective incomes and earning capacity, um, who has the primary care of children, um, how long the marriage or relationship has been on foot and whether that's affected one party's earning capacity because they put their career on hold to support the other person's career. Um, as I mentioned, retaining an asset with a contingent capital gains tax liability attached to it um, or if there's a future prospective inheritance. So if one party is assessed to have a greater need, um, then they will have a greater percentage of the property pool. Um, the principle behind that really being that, again, 
we're trying to finalise the financial affairs between parties who have separated. Um, ongoing spouse maintenance or alimony, as they talk about in the US, is not a common feature in Australia. Um, preferably, if a party has a need um, where they're at a disadvantage compared to the other, they should get a larger percentage of the property pool now, and then they're able to do with that what they think appropriate, and then the other party isn't beholden to support them for an ongoing period. Um, in terms of uh, earning capacity, um, we are looking at um, a party's ability to earn income and exercising that capacity. So not just um, they've decided to quit their job and think they would have a great lifestyle if they um, managed it in a particular way. Um, there's an expectation that people should um, work and uh, meet their own needs so far as they're able to do so, within reason taking into account care of children um, if they've been out of the workforce for a long period of time, etc. Um, it's acknowledged that the care of uh, caring for children um, is a significant burden and that the payment of child support um, doesn't really compensate the, care, the primary caring parent for the loss of career opportunity, employment mobility and independence of lifestyle which caring for children usually entails. Um, life expectancy uh, is an interesting one, can work against people in some cases in that um, if you are unwell um, but have a very short life expectancy, you also have a very small future need. So you're not likely to get an adjustment on that basis. Okay, the fourth and final step is to look at overall what percentage have we arrived at, looking at the contributions factors and then the future needs factors. Um, is that overall just and equitable in the circumstances of these particular parties? And also how do we practically implement that? If we're going to split the assets, say 60% to 40%, does that mean we need to sell some property? Um, if we did it 58 to 42 instead, does that mean someone could keep a property? Um, you know, is the overall outcome just and equitable? Um, we also take into account superannuation as part of that, um, <coughs> bearing in mind that depending on the age of the parties and what they're hoping to do, um, sometimes superannuation is very desirable, sometimes no one wants it because they can't access it for a long period of time. So how does that factor into the mix knowing that um, it's an important asset but um, in a lot of cases it can't be accessed for a considerable period of time. Right, so that's uh, the kind of basis on which we give advice to our clients about what their likely range is. Um, in terms of how do we turn that range into an outcome, um, it really depends on the particular um, circumstances of the parties and um, how well they're able to discuss the matter themselves and how reasonable the other party is. Um, ideally, if the parties can engage in direct negotiations with each other and come to their own agreement, um, that's the best outcome. Um, and a lot of people do that and we can just assist them with drawing up the paperwork to formalise that. Um, other options are uh, if they engage lawyers, sometimes a few letters exchanging offers can resolve um, the dispute. A roundtable conference where both parties attend with their lawyers to try and nut it out can be appropriate. Um, more commonly we have mediation which um, is actually something that the court requires parties to do anyway once or they're in the court process. Um, so when I'm talking about mediation I'm talking about a more formal process where um, a senior lawyer, so someone who's a solicitor or barrister, um, is engaged as the mediator. It's usually a full day event, both parties are legally represented um, and usually in family law matters it takes place as what we call a shuttle mediation. So um, each party and their lawyer is in a separate room and the mediator goes back and forth to um, exchange proposals, discuss proposals and options. Um, and that's normally a really successful way of resolving um, a dispute if the appropriate preparation goes into it. That is that um, you know, we have valuations of assets so we know what we're talking about dividing, um, there's been disclosure so everyone knows the parameters of the dispute um, and hopefully people have had some realistic advice about what their um, entitlements are. Uh, if none of those matters are appropriate then court is always our last resort. Um, the court process normally involves a first court hearing, um, this is in relation to property matters, um, at which the court will order disclosure, so the exchange of documents if it hasn't already happened. Um, 
parties to obtain valuations about any assets where there's a dispute, to attend mediation either privately if the court determines that the parties can afford it privately or the court can conduct a conciliation conference which is a mediation run by a registrar at the court. Um, if the matter still can't be resolved then it will go to trial. The moment waiting times are probably closer to the 24 months than the 12 months um, so it is some very significant delays there so court in a particular a trial is to really to be avoided if possible um, but only about five to ten percent of cases that are actually ever filed in court get to a trial most people do manage to resolve it um, well in advance of that if they're able to um, there is another process called arbitration which is starting to gain a little bit of popularity um, it is only available in financial and parenting uh, and property matters not parenting um, that is where a registered arbit arbitrator who's often a former judge or a senior barrister, um, is appointed by the parties as sort of a, a private judge. So it's run sort of like a trial, but the arbitrator makes a decision and you pay for that decision. Um, the benefits of that is that um, mostly um, the, it avoids the delay of being stuck in the court process. So it's starting to become um, a bit more popular given um, un the unfortunate delays in the court system. Uh, so, if you manage to get to an agreement, then what do we do? Um, it's really important that any agreement that you reach in relation to property settlement does actually get documented properly. Um, the main reason being finality. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a time period that you can um, apply to the court um, for property settlement. And if you haven't done a legally recognised agreement, then the court will disregard any informal agreement that you have made and can redo the property settlement. Um, there are some cases, particularly if people haven't bothered to get their divorce as well as a formal property settlement where some, uh, there's a case where it's actually 16 years after the party separated, someone applied to the court for a property settlement because um, they had never actually formalised their original agreement and that went on appeal all the way up. Um, you know, that's obviously a bit of an unusual one, but uh, I often have clients who have been separated for four or five years, never done a property settlement, never got a divorce order. Um, so it is really important to actually formalise an agreement once it has been reached to ensure finality. Um, the other advantages is that there is no stamp duty payable or any transfers pursuant to um, a formal agreement. So if one party is acquiring the interest of the other party in the house, for example, no stamp duty is payable. Um, there's also capital gains tax rollover relief um, if you're retaining um, an asset. It's also the only way that you can split superannuation. So um, a super fund is a, um, a third party. Um, they need to um, be given um, the orders or the agreement to actually enact the property, uh, the superannuation split. So there's two options for uh, formalising an agreement, um, consent orders and a binding financial agreement. So a consent order is a, um, a court approved process. So effectively what we do is we um, draw up the agreement in the form of orders, it's submitted to the court together with an application form. Um, both parties have to sign the application, but there is no requirement to get legal advice. Um, although obviously we recommend that people do. The court will then review the paperwork. There's no court hearing. If they're happy with the orders, then they will approve it. And that is then a binding and enforceable court order. Um, the other option is a binding financial agreement. Um, it doesn't go through the approval of the court, but each party must have independent legal advice about the document before they sign off on it. Now, whilst that might sound a bit more straightforward, um, because effectively um, they are opting out of their um, right to have the matter determined under the Family Law Act. The nature and extent of the advice we have to provide is quite extensive. Um, because it's not approved by the court, it's also a little bit riskier in terms of um, enforceability, um, etc. So um, normally you recommend a consent order, but there are some reasons that you might do a binding financial agreement in certain circumstances. And um, one of those is where um, the court's not going to approve the order. So where it offends the, um, the clean break principles. So if parties are trying to um, continue to operate a business together, keep a property for an extended period of time, or um, do something else that the court wouldn't normally approve of, then we do it in a binding financial agreement. 
Um, obviously, particularly at this point, it's really important that um, clients get um, tax and accounting advice um, and or financial advice about what the effect of the orders is going to be on them, um, whether it actually, um, what we have drafted as lawyers actually um, meets what they needed to do from an accounting um, perspective. Um, I just wanted to quickly cover off the um, production of documents um, from accountants. Um, it is something that um, most of the time that is something where the client themselves will request those from you to comply with their disclosure obligations but it is actually possible and we've certainly done this before to subpoena a party's accountant to get documents that they won't provide um, willingly. Um, the, how that process works is that um, the party who wants to issue the subpoena files it with the court, the court issues it, it gets served on the respondent or the, the respondent to the subpoena, so in this case in my example we're talking about an accountant here. Um, they would then produce the documents to the court and the court would decide whether um, the parties can look at them um, and copy them. Um, you can get your costs um, for complying with the subpoena and you can object to the subpoena if there's a, a good reason to in terms of um, the scope of the documents requested is too broad or um, too onerous. Um, we'd normally recommend that if you were getting subpoenaed um, to produce a client's document that um, you discuss it with your client even though it's not up to them whether or not you comply but perhaps also seek some legal advice um, prior to producing the documents just to ensure that um, the subpoena has been properly issued and that you do in fact need to respond to it. Um, as I mentioned before we're always urging our clients to get advice from their accountants, I'm sure that they always do but um, certainly in cases where they operate a business uh, particularly through a company or trust, um, have a self-managed super fund, obviously that um, is essential advice for them to get. Um, we want them to be getting advice about the tax and accounting implications of their proposed settlement, um, whether the proposed terms achieve the desired effect. Um, we're well aware that we're lawyers, not accountants. And whilst we might think we know what we're doing in terms of the, um, the drafting of orders, um, it's really important that uh, whoever's going to be implementing them, the, so the accountant, um, actually understands what they say and that they achieve the desired effect that the client is trying to achieve. Um, in the negotiation phase, clients might need to be getting advice about um, whether it's better for them to be retaining the existing trust or company structure or whether that's an opportune time to look at revisiting those arrangements given um, the advantages um, of restructuring under a property settlement um, in terms of um, CDT rollover relief, stamp duty exemptions, etc. So sometimes it can be a bit of an opportunity for restructuring. Um, Self-managed super funds, uh, clearly we need specific um, advice about the wording of the orders to make sure that it achieves what the client is trying to achieve. Um, and financial planning and insurance information. Um, we find particularly um, for some clients at an early stage that kind of advice is really useful. Um, bit of stereotyping here but uh, particularly for women who've been in a long relationship um, we often see clients, more often women than men, uh, but who've really never made a financial decision in their life. They come to us wondering how they could possibly survive on the six million dollar property settlement that they're going to get um, and their anxiety around that really prevents you from being able to resolve the matter. Um, we have um, a number of um, financial planners that we work with who specialise, particularly working with women going through the divorce and separation process, um, reviewing what is it they're trying to achieve, um, what kind of income could they get from their investments, what insurance do they need, um, and often that um, understanding and control over um, how they're going to manage their financial affairs alone um, really helps to um, move the negotiations forward. Um, and the last thing that I sort of wanted to touch on today before we get to whether there are any questions um, is practical things um, that clients might want to consider, particularly in the early stages of their separation. Um, the number one thing, of course, is to get preliminary legal advice at the earliest opportunity. Um, every case is very different. Um, 
everyone knows someone who's separated, everyone's spoken to their taxi driver who's been through a divorce or their hairdresser or whatever. Um, but every situation is really very different and it's important to get some preliminary advice about what your entitlements might be, um, how to sort of move things forward. Um, and if that means that, you know, the client takes that advice, comes to their own agreement, um, that's great. Um, it's just really important to be informed before they move ahead um, of, you know, what their position is and what their entitlements are. Another thing that's really important at the very early stages is for the client to can review their um, estate plan. Um, that's not something that we do here, but we certainly can refer clients to um, specialists in that area. Um, a will will become void um, upon divorce, or at least so far as it relates to appointing your former spouse as an executor or beneficiary. But um, more often than not, you want to change it once you've separated, even if you haven't yet finalised your property settlement. Um, consider revoking any powers of attorney that appoint your ex-spouse, um, superannuation nominations, and also severing the joint tenancy. So um, most um, married couples will own their um, real estate as joint tenants. Um, that means that the surviving joint tenant um, receives that property upon the death of the other joint tenant, regardless of what their will says. Um, it's pretty easy to sever the joint tenancy unilaterally. Um, again, that's something that you want to consider if it's going to take a while to resolve your property settlement. If you're trying to keep the house, usually stay in it, but it all depends. And again, good to talk to clients to give advice about that particular issue. Um, limiting liability. So if you've got um, a joint uh, mortgage that you can continue to draw down on, overdraft facility, credit cards, you might want to consider um, either cutting off those facilities or freezing those facilities so that they're joint to operate so that one party um, can't borrow further funds or take all of the, um, the funds out of the joint account. Um, balancing that with your own access to funds, sometimes it's a good idea to get a bit of a fighting fund together first. Again, it depends on um, the particular situation and the dynamics of the relationship and how upset the other party is going to get about that kind of behaviour. Um, contacting Centrelink. Um, as we all know, you can get into all sorts of debts with the uh, robo-debt situation if you're claiming things that you shouldn't. So when your circumstances change, you need to keep Centrelink informed about that, um, even if you're separated under the same roof. Um, collate and protect important documents. Um, we've sort of touched on all the things that are relevant in considering a property settlement. So particularly if you've got documents floating around about an inheritance you received, um, when you bought and sold properties and how much you paid for them, um, how much the mortgage was, those are all going to be relevant. Um, so if you can put those together and make sure that they're in a safe place, um, that's really important. Uh, think about changing passwords and PIN numbers. Um, and redirecting your mail. Uh, lots of people don't do that and their ex is quite happily continuing to look at their hotmail and um, the advice that you're giving them and all that sort of stuff. So definitely change those if you're like me and you use the same pin and password for everything. Um, photographing valuables. That's really more um, bits and pieces that it's going to be difficult to prove exist if um, they're not around anymore. So um, not so much things where obviously a vehicle you've got the registration for, you know, property, things like that. But um, these are more chattels and things like that that might um, have a value um, that it might be difficult to prove otherwise unless you've taken photos of them. Um, storing sentimental off items off site. Um, again, this is really just a practical thing rather than a legal thing. but. Um, someone really wants to hurt you, as people often do in a property settlement situation, um, often sentimental value items have no real value as far as the court concerned. Um, you know, you can't necessarily prove their existence, but someone might do something with them to really upset you. So particularly if you're living under the same roof, think about if there's anything that really means a lot to you, um, perhaps store it with some family or friends um, while you're sorting out your property settlement. Um, if you're living under the same roof, which actually happens quite a lot, um, particularly for financial reasons where um, it's going to take a little while for the parties to be able to afford separate households or sell the house that they're living in, um, if you can, it's really important to try and negotiate some boundaries about um, who gets what covered in the kitchen, are we still cooking together, who's going to do the laundry, um, are we just parenting the kids normally or 
you know, do you have the one week and I have the other and we sort of get out of each other's hair in the meantime. Um, a tricky process, but it can lead to a lot of problems um, if you don't talk about these things in advance. Uh, so really it's all about getting a plan. Um, and those are the kind of things that we uh, talk to clients about in addition to, I guess, the pure legal aspects of their case, um, because, um, you know, with a, a family law situation, um, a law is really only part of the um, the overall makeup of the dynamics of the negotiation um, and what's important to the client. So um, it's really important to get that advice as early as possible to look at what's appropriate in your case as opposed to your neighbour's case or your girlfriend's case or whatever it might be um, so that you can move forward confidently with um, a plan of how to resolve um, your settlement. So that's really all I wanted to cover today. Hopefully I've given you a bit of an overview of um, what's involved in a property settlement, the kind of things that we look at and how we try and help clients to resolve that dispute. Um, happy to uh, take any by email if you think of anything down the track that you are wanting to know a bit more about. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much for your attendance this afternoon.